welcome to the SAG After Foundations Conversations at Home. Uh, I am Ileana Douglas. I'm at my home in Connecticut. Very, uh, I feel like it's a Edward R. Murrow <laughs> at home with the stars. But uh, before uh, we start the uh, conversation, I just want to let you know that SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs for all SAG after artists. The conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. And over the past year, the foundation has given over $7 million in COVID relief uh, to more than 7,500 performers. <clears throat> and if you are a SAG after uh, artist and you need help, please, please ask. And if you can't help, please consider giving. Information about all of this can be found in the description of this video. Thank you very much. And now without further ado, it's Kristen Stewart. Welcome. First of all, <laughs> uh, congratulations on your Academy Award nomination. That must be very thrilling uh, yeah. for you. No, I mean, it's really, it must be very exciting. Of course, it must make you feel good that it brings attention to the film. Um, I mean, how do you, how do you feel about awards in general? Uh, well, I mean, somebody just asked me like a really fun question, which is like, what movies did you like this year? You know, everyone's talking about, it's like all of a sudden, if you're in the running to maybe be considered the best of the one this year, it just like, you know, I feel like performances are, are when they're good, they're totally incomparable. Like yes. you could never be like, she was better than her in that. It's like, you know, they, they're very different. And um, having said that, <clears throat> I want everyone to see my movie. And so I am thrilled, <laughs> but like, you know, uh, I don't know. I feel like um, all the turns of phrase, like, okay, icing on the cake, gravy, the cherry on top. Like, it really is just like, I'm already so proud of the dude that made this movie. The validation that I get from seeing his little sparkly little eyes when we start talking about it. Like yes. the fact that I got a nomination for me is literally just like Pablo. So yeah, it feels great. It's very cool. What, the, what I wanted to ask you, which is, it, I don't know if you ever heard, Robert, there's a famous phrase that uh, Robert Duvall once said, that it, it takes 20 years to learn how to become an actor. That's what he felt. It, take, it took 20 years to kind of garner all of your gifts. And I was thinking how ironic it is that you, it's, since you started from Panic Room to this is 20 years. So, <laughs> right. it, a, I mean, does it feel like a culmination or does that, because you're so young, it's hard to say, oh, it's a culmination, but yet it does feel like a culmination of a series of films you've been making over the last 10 years. Yeah, what's actually bizarre is that I did, I kind of had this like self-realized, like incredibly personal um, I don't know, um, kind of uh, like co coming of age thing in this movie, even though I'm playing a real person, it feels so, so, so completely mine. Mm -hmm. And I'm so lucky that this like 20 year, I'm at such a cool age to be good at something technically. Like, uh, and when I say good, what I mean is like kind of more just uh, like more in control and kind of like aware um, <clears throat> of how to get into something. Like, you know, every movie requires a totally different path and a different portal and at this point, I know for a fact I would never been able to make this movie even just like two years ago. I really was, he, he called me at the perfect moment. I really, I saw this thing as, um, I mean, I never want to stop acting in movies. I want to do, I, I couldn't imagine it. I, it is my, it is my pathway into my life. Mm -hmm. um, and in this one, I felt like, um, I don't know, this is so cheesy, dude, but like I dance more because of this movie. I feel through her, I was able to kind of like wrap my arms around myself. Like I just felt like huge amounts of like, this is lame, just like self-love through this person. And I just like, that's fucking contagious. And I think that's why it was so fun to make. Everyone on this movie, like I felt it. Like we all sort of went like, let's hold each other. That's a really beautiful, I don't think I had like the confidence to do that as a younger person. Is so along those same lines, how do you feel? Do you feel that it's just confidence? How do you feel your acting has changed 
obviously going from a child actor to an adolescent actress to a woman are three completely distinct changes. But, and you said you were garnering your skills. Are you, are, does the moment click where you're like, oh, I, I know how to do that. And some of the technical aspects of, of acting. I think when I was younger, I like would harness a lot of anxiety and kind of use, use a certain physical pressure, mm -hmm. but that is very unruly and you can't really rely, you can't rely on it. Um, and I think as I've gotten older, I kind of trust process more. Um, like I like to do things in a sort of more concerted way than I used to. I uh -huh. used to be like, I can never rehearse. I'm just like so cripplingly insecure about everything. It's like, has to be like this honored moment where the right. only time you can ever do something is once. It's like, that's not true. It, you know, there are certain things that I used to tell myself that now I see were just, I mm -hmm. don't know, like, like they, cer certain things, like if you're not scared, you're not doing the right thing. Um, anything over prepared is false. Uh, I just don't feel any of those things anymore because I think the closer I get to myself and um, like my real life, I can kind of, I can, I can take all of that and put it into my work. And there can be this thing that's like, there's no separation. And uh, I don't feel like I'm protecting myself anymore. I don't feel like I'm tricking anyone anymore. Like I, I really just feel like even if I totally fall flat on my face, it's worth, it's worth, uh, doing it in a concerted way and not being like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I guess it was just the moment lightning in a bottle. It's like, no, fuck yeah. that, you're telling a story. Yeah. Is it also a matter of um, trusting yourself? I were, when I was starting at acting, you know, every take had to be 100% tears, complete and say, you know, or it didn't feel good. And as you get older, I think you learn maybe how to modulate emotion you know, for yes. different camp for scenes, you know, cause it's an energy game too. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I, I love when film act, cause film acting is so different to like stage acting as you know, also I can't believe I'm talking to you by the way. I just love you so much. Like not to like stop this and just be whatever, but this is very cool for me. Um, well, and it's funny that you're asking me these questions and then I'm like, oh, well, let me tell you about acting. So I'm like, you're, you're well, no, that's what I'm always fat. Believe me, I've got, I, 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 you know, I always, I, I've, I love actors and I love interviewing actors. And one of the things that always bothers me, you know, when I'm watching a movie, what I think about is, you know, the consistency, which is, we'll get to some of those questions later. I'm like, you know, she had to do that all day long. It wasn't mm -hmm. like we, as an audience, we see one scene, but I yeah. see it as like, that's 14 hours. She had to drive yeah. to the set and deal with craft service. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of things like that, that I, that go into, I think, um, becoming, uh, you know, acting in it on a dime. And so all, all of the, all of those things now along those same lines, do you, um, do you recognize or have you ever fallen into a bag of tricks that you know, you can rely on like, Oh, I can cry on a dime or, you know, are you, do you have two or are, you know, two separate, use i mean i have a bag of tricks i'm just gonna be honest right yeah you know they, you can you can lean on on a day you know and then you feel sometimes guilty because you you say well geez i'm leaning on your bag on my bag of tricks um i get so sad when things don't bubble up naturally and you go like okay well i gotta tell this story right now the best that i can right now because it is such a mood oriented thing and sometimes you just don't feel it like as you know yeah. or you come together with a group of people and it kind of like all of your ambitions are impossible because the energy is just off and it's not right and the movie needs to still be made because we're all here yeah. um that is just god that sucks uh but i I'll, i will say i'm not very good at it some people are really great at it um i am um I mean, God, I guess I could like keep my eyes open for a while until they get glossy. There are certain stupid things where you go, God, we just need to like put something in this moment and there's nothing happening. It's not my strong suit. I, I think in terms of like bags of tricks, 
I cannot make myself cry on cue. Um, <laughs> I, I absolutely not. In fact, there's like one moment in Spencer where I was, there was only one scene that it was like very uh, leading in the script that it was like, this is the moment where it all comes flowing out of her. And she, her life flashes before her eyes and she like thinks of her self as a child and she's in her childhood bedroom. And it literally is just like the whole, the weight of her entire life is released in this moment or something that's in like in the script. I was like, I can't fucking do that. Yeah. And I was really tired. And Pablo was like, there's nothing better than a tired actor. And I was like, nah, I don't know if that's true right now. And um, yeah, like I used a song. Like I, I usually totally judge people for not being present and needing to sort of like bring some like sentimentality in in order to like trick themselves into crying. But right. there was like a, there was a, an ELO song that just destroyed me in relation to her because it was kind of about like loss loss and and dreams and I don't know kind of like like dying childhood dreams mm -hmm. I'm not good at manipulating myself dude like I actually wish that I and it's very cool I wish I could be like of course I got my bag of tricks I actually am just not very good at that and that that sounds um like self-effacing but it also is like a total point of pride I'm like I, I when I'm not feeling it I'm ter fucking terrible the uh Okay, this is, I don't know if you're going to hate this part or love it, but we have to go back a little bit in time just about yeah. your uh, beginnings of, um, you know, why you become, wanted to go into acting. I know you grew up in Los Angeles, so you grew up around actors, and your father is a stage manager, I believe, right? Yeah. Um, a very cool, hip-looking stage manager. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um so was that was it always something that was in the air being growing up in Los Angeles or how, how did you go about that career choice uh so my mom is also a script supervisor mm -hmm. and so I would go um like to set with her all the time and you know like my our our family friends were directors and stuff and um I saw, I literally remember seeing a little kid on a movie set once and I was like, wait, what is that? Like, oh, right. Like I could, like, I could maybe do that. Like you could tell me that I could stay and that I didn't have to leave like whatever and go back to school. Um, I would have done anything to get close to the energy that I felt when I was little. And I didn't know why it's not like I was a huge, like a uh, cinephile at age eight. <laughs> it's, you know what I mean? I just, I really yeah. loved this, like, circusy vibe and people talk about that but it really is like to make movies is like unless you love it it's the most thankless stupid thing to do <laughs> it's just it's stupid like mutual investment that like barely ever pays off do you know what I mean like it's unless you're yeah. so obsessed with it and my parents were and I just sort of like I think it's genetic like I think I just was like I, I don't know what else I would do I love acting because when you're on a set I always say everybody is looking at me <laughs> Really? Oh, dude, I couldn't have been. I was like, not that at all when I was little. Well, see, to me, it's like, that's the thing about a film set is you have this complete power, you know, like nothing can go for everybody's touching you and you're bringing you coffee and focused on you. So, I mean, to me, I was like, I always wanted to be an actor just because I it was like, I, it, you get all this, you know, great uh, kind of attention, even though you dismiss all the failure and rejection that comes along <laughs> right comes along oh, that's it. funny um so when I had, to, I had to like I had to push through all that stuff when I was little I was like I think that I, my whole approach to acting is like so masochistic and not in a way that's like self-aggrandizing like I yeah. suffer for my work I was fucking shy when I was little I was like genuinely I made people uncomfortable because I was very uncomfortable so, so why yeah. were you sh why were you shy I mean you're obviously look very you know, attractive. And I, I, I would think that, you know, the, and your parents being in show business and hmm. why do you think you were shy? I, that's like a total chicken egg. I have no idea. <laughs> that's like, you know, I think that's a, uh, I think that's why I was attracted to it as well as it's like, if I could, there's something about revealing yourself. There's something like totally, um, mm -hmm. you know, what's it called? Uh, uh, what's when you want to get naked in public? um my life no uh <laughs> yeah there's just like some word for it and I can't remember it right now because oh, okay. but like there was like oh, this uh, exhibitionist 
Yes. Okay. And it's cool because like, you know, if you feel kind of invisible and like, it's really hard to convey and it's hard to get across and then you go, okay, I'm going to try in the most elaborate way to do so. Yes. That that was attractive to me. I was like, you know, yeah, whatever. I kind of, it's like slamming your face through like a plate glass window. So before you got um, panic room, did, did you face rejection? Is it, I mean, was that hard being a, child actor and what I mean the the pressure of you know seeing parents come in with their kids and that all seems so daunting to me oh yeah um yeah when you're little you can't take like beta blockers and stuff like that you know what I mean you're just a little guy um I my mom was like such a reluctant stage mom she really was embarrassed didn't want to have to do like fill that role and I I didn't face like tons of rejection. I guess I didn't like auditioning for commercials and stuff because it would be like, come in and like dance to this jingle. And I would like rather jump out the window. And um, for a minute I was like, thank you for driving me around Los Angeles, you know, tirelessly mom. I love you so much, but I don't know if this is like necessarily going to work out for me because I'm never going to get those fucking jobs. And then I, I met this director that cast me in my first movie. I was like nine years old and it's this really sort of, unique and like whatever like it's a little indie movie that you know Rose Trochet directed I was just about to stop going to auditions because I was like I'm not a kid actor I wanted to be in movies I don't think it's ever gonna happen and I was so lucky she literally that very day was like be in my movie and I was literally a hair away from being like I can't dance and I can't dance for like you know Kool-Aid anymore now did you have did you ever have a backup plan if you didn't make it as an actor like, yeah, I, I would have no, like. I, I had no backup plan. I still don't. <laughs> I still, right. You know, it was like, no, I'm going to make it. Even though so many people told me, like a lot of people told me I wasn't going to make it. I, I heard that a lot. I mean, it had to just brush over me. But did people, did people encourage you or did you feel people didn't get you? Um. Only like in the sort of like commercial realm, as soon as I started like working with directors and I found wow. like my people, it happened, dude, I was so little. I was so young. I can't, I'm so unbelievably lucky. I would have just gone back to school. I would have gone back to the third grade. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? That, yeah. So, um, so no, I've never had to have a backup plan. No. The, um, was it intimidating at all to work with somebody like David Fincher, who's a bit of a taskmaster? I mean, he's this master filmmaker and Jodie Foster, accomplished actress and a director herself. And that's your first movie. Like that's out of the gate. Do you want to know what? Jodie Foster was cast as my mother because Nicole Kidman dropped out of that movie and we had rehearsed for like three weeks together. And so I had... My second experience, I was like, I, I had the most loaded, I had a full on masterclass from two of the most seminal actors of our time, <laughs> like wow. all in one experience. Now, uh, now you and Nicole are in the same category. In my, uh, this, well, because this isn't real. I'm um, making this up. It's the matrix. It's a simulation. I'm designing it very, very, very well. <laughs> <laughs> um. I want to talk a little bit about, so coming out of that, uh, did you, uh, you worked with uh, Sean Penn in um, Into the Wild, which is, and I had read that you said that he really, he kind of influenced your career in some way. Was that because you saw a path to, this is the kind of movies I want to make, or this is the kind of career I want to have, or what what does that mean exactly that he had an influence on you? Um, that movie was just really, it gave me a new feeling. It was so yeah. liberated. It was yeah. crazy. It was like, it was like, um, uh, my mom always tells me, or when I was little, especially she would be like, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. We've been doing this for a long time. We know how to make movies. Like I couldn't disagree with that more. Mm-hmm. Every movie requires a, a different process and approach and, and just an entirely different but you start and you end in a different whatever um yeah. so with with sean i was like um it was the first time somebody like 
kind of ran away from the crew with a camera and two actors and just the cameraman who is Eric Gautier, who's like one of the most fucking masterful DPs I've ever, I've worked with him twice. Um, it, it felt like we, I don't know. Um, it was really wild. <laughs> In fact, yeah, it, you're talking about yeah. into the wild. That's like, you know, embarrassing to say, but like it felt very driven and purposeful, but also, um, like he didn't really know what was going to happen, but he definitely knew where he wanted to end up. But the path to get there was ours to design. And I was like, mm -hmm. I had never experienced that before. And so I knew that I wanted to be a director. I knew I wanted to make movies for a long time, but this sort of made me realize like, like the best advice in life is never articulated. It's when you see other people doing things the way you want to do them and you go, oh my God, it's possible. That's, it's, this possibility is there. Whether or not I'll ever be able to do it is another thing, but just the fact that I will try, mm -hmm. that movie that movie made me understand like like the that movie like gave me a mark to hit emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can I can totally see that because it's very unself conscious and it's and it's very it's got large ideas about being yourself and following a path and love and forgiveness, but it's not self-conscious at all. You know, right. that's what I think is so beautiful about it. It is, um, it's a really beautiful film. I, I, and it was actually fun to revisit it and re and rewatch, you know, rewatch the film. And it really, it certainly holds up. Oh, and, cool. Yeah. It's, a, it's, do you ever go back and rewatch your movies or is that ever? Uh, sometimes, especially ones that I'm not in that much, to be honest. I, I don't not like watching myself either. It's not that I, um, I need to, do you watch your work? Like after you do, I am addicted. I need to see, it's like a whole experience of like a, like a checks and balances type. Yeah. Sometimes it completes the I process for me. I mean, what's always interesting is that it's very much like a home movie because you're watching the movie, but then you're thinking what was happening that day and circumstances. So it's like the yeah. home movie part of it too. And what I love, what, again, what was interesting about the film, rewatching that film was how much of Sean Penn's philosophies what I perceive to be his philosophies, because I don't really sure. know, bleed through the film in a, mm -hmm. in a very touching, uh, loving way. You know, that. Yeah, it's the movie is like incredibly earnest. Exactly. It, like it really, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's but not it, trying to be cool at all. Yeah. No. And yet, in the midst of that, it is, it, you know, as I said, it's never. Other survival movies that I've seen are extremely can be extremely self conscious, and I right. I didn't you know I I didn't think this was the um, now this was something when I went back because I've been I've been on a Kristen Stewart film fest so I've been watching a lot of your movies and <laughs> I one of the things I picked up on in this in Into the Wild and other films you and you may not know this or maybe you do know it. You are a great watcher of other people and you have something going on as you're watching them, but I don't know what it is. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't, now I've, I've watched other people and they maybe are watching something and you know exact, their job is to translate. Oh, I know exactly, you know, what Warren Beatty is, thinking as he's watching mm -hmm. but with you i was i said in film after film and we're going to get to the runaways in a minute because i love the run that's such a great movie oh, but cool. you are a watcher of other people but and what do you think are you are, you know is it are you thinking of something or, or or maybe you're not thinking of anything and i'm just perceiving you as being a great watcher right Does that yeah sense? i'm like yeah yeah no no completely um well, i guess there's no way for me to point of you Watching with a point of view. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no. Um, well, uh, earlier, actually, you, you asked, like, um, like if there was stuff I had learned or something. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really, really hard to do nothing in a movie. Yes. But most of the time, people aren't doing anything. Most of the time, people are not broadcasting 
their emotions in order to tell a story. Um, sometimes it's way more fun to like look at someone and be like, project anything. Choose your own adventure, man. I'm having my own, but it is definitely not for you. Right. Um, uh, it, that's something that you get when you get a little bit older, like to actually take up space on screen and, and be, yeah, doing nothing is like really hard to do because you always feel like you're like, oh, I need to fill the space. I need to like tell the story right now. It's like, I just don't think that's, yeah. very, I just don't think it's real. Um, I, th- so I yeah. thought that was something fascinating and I saw it in, in film after film. When you're he, like, she does nothing. <laughs> no, I'm thinking, yeah. I have no idea what you're thinking. So I'll give you another example. In the film, The Runaways, when um, when Cherry doesn't want to sing and you're just watching her and you are you don't really know what your opinion is about her not wanting to sing until finally, finally you explode. But you right. don't... Um, there's no uh, sense that you're getting frustrated. You th- you're just watching her. And so it's com- it's very compelling. Um, so I think like as soon as you fully, this is going to sound so pretentious. I was just, I just read this. When you f- define something, when you, wow. when you ascribe something, a word, and you put a period on it, it dies. It's mm-hmm. like the conversation should keep resonating. If anything's worth really sort of ruminating on, it's because we can't figure it out. It's like the reason we're still making movies about fucking Diana. <laughs> like, I know that there's been two movies, there's a stage thing, there's a show. Like, it's just we are obsessed because y- you-, you can't fill in those blanks. Um, so yeah, that-, that is not something that I like put effort towards, but I guess like in interviews, you can like kind of step back and try and like think about like what you've done. Um, I love, love, love working with directors that are not trying to shove the story down your throat, but they're just allowing something to happen and not knowing where that's going. There's Mm -hmm. such a tension in that. Um, There's such a friction between like thinking that you're being entertained or sort of delivered a story or um, like a theme or a moral fucking lesson. I don't want to make movies about that. I want to watch people be like, that's my fate. That's my, and then from that, take what you want again, learn your own lesson, but I don't want to teach anyone any lessons. I don't want to teach anyone anything. I just want to have experiences and then sort of like, maybe if we get lucky, capture it and be like, what the fuck was that about? Um, I, I was thinking in this period too. Um, and then I'm going to throw another movie in there. Seabird, which is another very, very complicated woman, the actress, Jean Seabird. I mean, these are very, complex uh women you know and do you is it ever and then you know and the same thing with diana which we're going to get to is does it ever feel daunting to or is that the challenge to i'm going to take on gene seberg i mean that is like a monumental um mysterious Mm. actress with an incredibly tragic past what what drew you to seaberg i'm just curious um so i love her first of all and i think there's no way i really love movies about real people that are not biopics not to sort of like beat a dead horse because everyone says that biopics have a hard time going deeply into anything um it's such an interesting way of looking at a life to sort of just be more specific about a a very particular time. Mm -hmm. And this was not perfectly historically accurate. Like we didn't, we, again, these are not creative liberties. It's more just that I think to be more truthful about something, you kind of step away from some of the specificity of like reality. Um, In this case, that movie was so cool to me because it felt so contained. And she felt so contained within this sort of stifling environment. And that year was just such a gnarly year, like 1968, 1969. Like I I wanted to live in that time and I wanted to experience like the type of power that she had, but also like she was so, she was so stripped and so sort of like held in a, in a corner. The tragedy of her life still just gets me like, I can't believe it. I can't, I just can't believe that that's actually what happened to that person. Yeah. Um, and we like, don't go into that, but I don't know, historically speaking, 
she was a groundbreaking figure and we don't know that. Like, I just didn't, I knew Jean Seberg had a sort of like, I knew that she had taken her life and that like her, you know, she became like an expat and didn't come back to the States. I knew there was like something that happened with like Black Panthers, but I was like, when I actually figured out like really what, what she had done and, and how committed to activism she was from like age 14, I was like, what a psycho, what a crazy, <laughs> to, to come from like a small town and be like the champ, to, just to, to be so drawn to and mov- motivated by something that could be very alienating and you could be like this sort of awful, like white savior. Imbi- just, it was such a slippery slope she decided to, to, to go down that I was like, yeah. so in. I just think that she's such a fucking awesome, um, I don't know, she's a very, I, I have a lot of respect for that person. Um, and I thought the story was cool because it wasn't, it wasn't perfect and it was kind of like an old school, um, it kind of felt like a movie that they would have made in the sixties or something. Like yes. it was like kind of sexy and we, and like, do you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, uh, it didn't take itself too seriously, but also I just felt like it really, I, I don't know. I, I, I liked making that movie. Well, she's a fascinating, again, kind of tragic figure. And, and I think that, you know, we benefit and actresses benefit by the openness that we have today, these people's private lives, they couldn't do anything. Mm. Um, and, and and so that's another terrific movie. Um, I want to talk briefly about a movie, Still Alice. And again, just a great. Now, now that is an example of working in an ensemble cast. And now how did how does that how do you feel working in an ensemble when you're not the lead? The, you have less pressure. You're just, you know, you're the, you're there to complement the other actors. How does that feel? Sometimes it's more pressure though, because you're only there for a minute. And so you better like, you better make a good impression. Well, right. That was quite a, quite a cast there. Yeah. So um, yeah. Of, 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 of going and again, working a very unusual with the director, Richard Glatzer, who I, who I knew who was mm-hmm. uh, in a wheelchair and that must've been just an incredibly moving uh, experience just to go. I, I never heard of a movie being, made that that way and yeah what, what was that like yeah this was it was his last movie and uh you know that that particular disease alzheimer's that julie that julie depicted in the movie um early onset in in particular it holds hands with a lot of the stigma attached to als like because obviously you know one person's losing their mind and then the other person can't express themselves there's just it really it was really beautiful to see someone still be able to express themselves he directed that movie from the inside in a in a really really impactful way like i had one of the best experiences of my life with that guy and also his partner wash and um because they directed the movie as a team but uh i've known julie for a long time i worked with her husband when i was little he cast me in a movie like a like the only kid like little kid movie i ever did was called catch that kid uh-huh. And Bart Freundlich directed it. And she always was like a really maternal figure in my life. And um, I, I, I would do anything for that woman. Um, and I'm not saying that in like the cheesy actor way where you say like, oh, I just love my co-star. She is like my work mom. Yeah. I, she, do you know, Julie? She's literally one of the most wonderful people walking the earth. Not personally, but just again, an yeah. incredible actress with an incredible yeah. body of work that's you know mesmerizing. Um, yeah, and so to play um, to play her kid, uh, also like because in the movie we have kind of a like a like a difficult relationship. We're not fully expressed. We have like a frustrating dynamic, and then the kid that has like this frustrating dynamic is the one that can actually like stick around and handle the weight of what her mother is going through with this like yeah. degenerative disease. I felt so complete. It's also, she like won an Oscar. She like won her Oscar for this. She, I, I can't believe like, you know, you could have given it to her for a million things throughout her career. I can't believe that I was able to like be there for this moment, even just in a small way. Yes. Um, I loved, I loved making that movie with her and I love being a small part of a movie that I really admire. It's, it's uh, sometimes it's more fun than being the star of the movie. Um, so in the same year, then you do uh, Clouds of Sils Marie with Juliette Binoche. And I saw in an interview, she was talking about 
she showed you Ingmar Bergman movies. Now, were, had you been a fan? Had you known? I mean, that's like, a, had you known Ingmar Bergman films before then? Did she, would she show you Persona or? Yeah, it was, yeah, Persona was like the one. Um, she started with Persona? That's like. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm back. Uh, cries of that was anything crazier. Uh, that was definitely Olivier having like a weird kind of like meta experience with life yeah. and art, like fold, folding in on itself. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, it was that a, a, again, a very complex, you have a very complex relationship uh, with her. She's playing an actress and she's got, it's a very, that is another example because I just watched it where you're constantly, I have no idea what you're thinking for the first half. <laughs> I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> no, it's you're good like, it, because it keeps me on the edge of my seat. Um, it's, what's really fun is to watch a movie <laughs> and then years later watch it again and know, you know, like, how how lucky I feel just to, I can ask you questions about it now, you know? So that was an example when, I mean, I'm sure you guys get along, everybody gets along, but in some ways it is a very competitive film. She's an older actress. You're a younger actress. Is that a, is that a, a wary kind of a feeling going into a movie like that? Cause I think all actresses are kind of, Afraid of competition. Actresses. That. <laughs> Afraid of other actresses. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know what I mean? Like you, <laughs> you're getting ready at the same time and, oh, she's going to wear that. I guess I'm going to have to wear this. So she's going to have curly hair. I guess I'll have to do this. You know, yeah. there is a little bit of jostling, even if it's in the nicest way. So yeah, just throw something at me about it in terms of what that movie is. And she seems like a very strong personality. Those French don't fool. Don't they don't mess around. Um, no, she's a terrifying woman. I, truly. But in a way that is just like, I couldn't, I couldn't like be more in awe of a human. Yeah. Also, I think that she's like an animal actor. She is the most, you talk about a, a, a toolkit. She can yeah. do anything to the point where I'm like, shut up, stop fucking crying. <laughs> but the thing is, she she never, ever, ever feels like fabricated. It always yeah. is like, I don't understand the well from which she pulls. I don't know what kind of inner life she's working with, but it is. Have you ever, I mean, have you, have you seen her in blue? It's the greatest it's, performance of all time. I can't, I can't understand how she did that. Um, yeah, she's but, amazing. She's really yeah, she's amazing. But right. working with her on this, I am the biggest proponent of like um, deferral. I always am like, you got it, man. Like that is where I find my power is like, yeah. Interesting. you want straight hair? I'm going to go perm my head. Oh, yeah. would you like to have, you want to go first? I'll go second. You want to go second? I'll go first. Like I really always, especially in regards to this movie, I was her assistant in this movie. I serviced her completely. Yeah. I, I was doing my job right if I was like, like I, I would run lines with her because she, like she, you know, I, I never run lines. I, I literally felt like I was helping her make a movie. I wanted to be her assistant on that movie. And like, I was. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, the, uh, did you ever see uh, All About Eve? Yeah. Davis? Yeah, it's got that. Yeah. Which the cool is thing is, it's weird. Like we have a, uh, she told me when, um, so we went to the Caesars for that movie and she was like, you will never win. It is, it is crazy that you were even nominated. The French, they will never, ever, ever give you this award. And I was like, okay, cool. So I was like, what should I say if I, yeah, I was like, thanks dude. And then I did get it. And I was like, okay, Julie. Um, but she also is, um, she is the, she's a cliche version of like a French actress. She's not lying. She actually is that person. And the hand up that she gives you is yeah. so soulful. And like, so like, if you ever became, I don't know. I think I would love to, uh, I would love to talk about like that whole dynamic for like an hour, but I guess we can move on. It was very, very, very interesting. The, the amount of times reality folded on that 
and yeah. in his work in general is the coolest thing about it. It's a great movie and could even be done as a play. Mm. As I rewatched it, it could be a play like right now. Yeah. You, know, they, you could with very, I was thinking, oh, it'd be great to have various actresses take this on, you know, right. and read it out loud. Um, right. Before we get to Spencer, my only question about uh, Twilight, because I have to bring it up, is um, in rewatching Twilight movies, <laughs> what I really loved about it was the teen romance aspect of it. Again, it's completely unselfconscious. And the fact that lately there don't seem to be any romantic, even the romantic movies for, you know, are, are kind of fraught and disturbed and, and they're very dark. Whereas, you know, it, it, do you miss or do you feel like there's a lack of romantic teen movies? With vampires, no, no with vampires. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but hey, man, it's been that, that aspect for for you know teenagers and people to to not feel like they got to be so hip and cool about romance. I, to me, that's what works about this about the story about the stories. Yeah, my favorite part of it was just how. Uh like subjugated she was. I thought it was like a weird sort of BDSM story, which is obviously why like all the fan fiction turned into another franchise alongside of our movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just thought like it was a, I, I had never done a teen movie before. I really wanted to do one. I had just done a movie called Adventureland, which was kind of like an adjacent teen movie dream that I had always, like I wanted to be like in an 80s movie. And then I did. And then right on the tail end of that, I was given this, book and this idea to pursue and I was like oh man let's like lean fully into not cheese but like I guess it, I, I guess like um just like paying credence to teenage feeling like um yeah that's, that's really what, honoring it yeah that's what I'm saying is that it's you know nowadays again I notice with young people it's like feelings are embarrassing so everybody's got to be so hip and closed off that it, uh, you know, that you need a movie to, right. to, to, you know, to go to, to visit those feelings and make those feelings okay. And just celebrate it. Like love is supposed to be fun. It doesn't have to always be so filled with angst and things like that. Um, yeah, the, fir the first time you the first time you fall in love, it absolutely feels like nobody has ever done it before. No yeah. one will ever do it as good as this. And it's yes. like, um, it's going to kill me. And that like is the perfect way to like that is definitely how you tell a teenage love story is that you're like, I want my boyfriend to suck the life out of me. I yes. loved that. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's the days. OK, let's get to Spencer. Um because I'm going to run out of time. I got so many questions about Spencer. The, my first question is, were, did you have any kind of particular feelings about Princess Diana before you did the film? Any kind of no. opinions about her? Or? Um, I knew like my, uh, my whole interaction with her as an idea was just that I remembered when I was like, I was seven years old when she died and I remember seeing all the flowers outside of Buckingham Palace and I remember it as an event like mm -hmm. you know when you remember things in life that happen and you go oh, yeah I was this age when this happened and yes. that is something on the dot on my you know I have a visual memory of all of that and I knew that like the loss is palpable people are obsessed with her mm -hmm. I didn't really know much about her I had not become somebody who I had not like fallen in love with her yet uh, it was through this movie that I really got to like know my version of her. But um, I definitely knew that like my whole thing was, I can't believe we lost her and gosh, that really upset people. You know what I mean? So I had to unpack that. But at that point that was pretty vague. Yes. I remember when, where I was when she died and it felt like something died uh, a sense of style, you know, it, uh, a woman that you just kind of looked forward to seeing what she was going to do next, I think. And that's what ended about it. You know, th that you wanted to see what other things she was maybe going to, um, uh, you know, accomplish. Um, 
so the film for people who haven't seen it, it takes place 10 years into the marriage. The marriage is not going so well. You know, Camille Parker Bowles is they're having the the uh, affair and then you're on your way. Um, beautifully shot film, by the way. Mm. We're going to get to all of that. Uh, you're going to the ca- to the to the castle to spend this Christmas weekend. So everything happens within this kind of uh, three day period. Did you do a reading of the script before you went into it with everybody? Because the relationships in the film with each person are become very important. So did you do a reading before? Nothing. Really? We were, so, we were so isolated because of uh, the, we were really sort of height of a, of a lockdown scenario. And oh. um, once everyone actually arrived, we were stuck oh. together, but we had no lead up. Uh, we all did our prep completely um, isolated. And even me and Pablo, like we didn't get anything up on its feet. We talked about every scene a lot, but Pablo is very much somebody who like, he's, he, he's so much more obsessed with uh, like tone and style and mm-hmm. a kind of essence type thing that like the script was perfectly written. We really did do it kind of, we did it word for word, except for one, the one scene with the boys over the candlelight where it's like, we're playing a game and it's very much alive. And it feels different to everything else that happens in the movie. And that's what you're yeah. protecting because the rest of it is very precise. Um, but yeah, no, we didn't, we didn't meet up at all. One of the things I really loved about the directing of the film is that everything feels so beautiful and yet you can never enjoy it. It's, and I don't know how he was able to achieve that, but it's like, oh, that's a nice chair. Oh, they're off on that. You know, you ne- he never lands just as you're feeling about to relax. There, it, tension is, is, is brought into the, uh, is brought into every scene and and is that something that i'm just picking up on or something that he was doing with the camera it's something he was doing with the camera it's so particular it's his commitment to the first person perspective is unlike anything i have ever seen it reminds like there's this movie rosetta Mm -hmm. you know the darden like it's like a it's basically like they keep the camera on her shoulder the entire time and so you feel like you are this person And um, it's such a rich world. His commitment to that perspective was unfaltering. And like, I would have gotten distracted as a filmmaker. I would have been like, ooh, let's look at the chair. Like, I, I, you know what I mean? He he doesn't ever do it. You never ever step outside of her experience ever. It is is unobjective, which is why it can be such a dream. Um, But it it absolutely is the way he shot it. Everything's right here or right here. Mm -hmm. And the only time he ever jumps out it feels like a tableau that could never exist. It feels like the most oppressive, vast, freezing cold. It was, I just was so impressed with him the whole time. I was like, the, how far he pushed into the surreal aspects of it. Like I read it in the script, but he is insane. He like, <laughs> you could have directed this movie in a number of ways. How far he pushed it blew my mind. And I think that it's so compassionate. I just love that he like cares so much about a woman's feelings that he's like, that he really descriptively, descriptively like a nightmare shoots it instead Mm -hmm. of being like, go cry in the corner and we can like imagine what that feels like. It's like, fuck that. Let's go, let's go in. Let's like go fully in. I, yeah. And you know, I have a question for you actually, like, you know, when you're doing a movie and you feel like um, kind of compelled to tell the director that they're not seeing something because you're so inside of it. And the right. camera can sometimes have a more objective view that you want to say, you know, maybe we stick with this perspective, but just like come over here for a second. There's a whole thing happening and, and you definitely can't see it from where you're standing. Yeah. I never had to do that. I couldn't hide from this man. There was right. nothing that I ever felt like wasn't fully visible and caught like a magician. And also our DP, like Claire Methon is literally like a, I don't know, like, like psychic or something. I would be like, I think I'm going to run over here, like jump off the balcony. And she would be like over there before I was it, crazy. Like really, really, we were like this three headed animal. It's great when you're in sync like that with a director where the camera is exactly where you want it to be. Sometimes you have a feeling 
you do a scene and then when you see it later, you go, oh, that's funny. It looks so much different than how yeah. we shot it. But this was a movie that as you're watching it, 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 as you said, the camera's always in the place you want it to be. It's the best. Uh, picking something up. Okay, I want to talk about the relation. As I said, I, one of the things I was fascinated about was the, the various relationships. My favorite being with Major Gregory, uh, mm -hmm. played by Timothy Spall, who is mm -hmm. hired as your kind of security guard. He's supposed to make sure that you don't get into trouble. And tell me about the relationship with that actor. He's horrifying. He's like something out of The Shining. <laughs> But, I know um, he's an evil man. He's te he's terrible, but and your scenes are just um, your scenes are just are really great with him. You never break, and again, it's 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 very. Um, just tell me about your what, your relationship with him and that paranoia that, that you get from him. Um, yeah, it's weird because if you reframe all of the things that he does and says to Diana in the movie, they could be benevolent. They actually right. could be like, I'm just trying to help you out, man. You have to be at dinner on time. Yes. It's going to go so much better for you if you just come to dinner on time. Like, it makes yeah. sense. And and the way he talks about his oath and stuff is so move, moving. And But it also is tough because as much as she is like shattering glass ceilings, she also also has the same sort of reverence for her power and her job and like what it, the good that it can do. And so in another world, they're friends. In another world, they're, they have the same cause. Do you know what I mean? They're both yeah. obviously on different sides at this point, but like, you know, kind of for the same cause. And um, with Tim, he's first of all, just like a master I, he's one of, again, one of our, he's one of our greats. And like, I, Pablo couldn't even, Pablo was such a fangirl. Every single time he came on set, he would just be like, can you believe it? <laughs> like, so he came with this like steeped, amazing sort of like, you know, British historical thing that I was yeah. intimidated by. But Diana, when I see her um, in certain interviews and in certain pictures, the, the power that she wields is so, it's so much, I, I couldn't even, like I had to sort of imagine that I could touch something like that, but mm -hmm. it felt really good to pretend to be like, there is nothing you can say to me, Timothy Spall. <laughs> like you, you think you know, you think you have some sort of idea of my experience yeah. I am so much bigger than you. I am so much taller than you. I will outlive you if I died yesterday. Fuck you. It like it just felt like um all of the lessons that she that he was trying to teach her were things yeah. that she was that she was learning the hard way in that moment and to just have somebody mansplain things to you that you already believe in is just like and the 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 violation of her, of him watching her so consistently is oh. uh yeah. it made me I was like enraged. I truly <laughs> like I could have I, I I like shoved an entire cake down my throat. Also, there's one scene in the movie that, that was cut. Scene, there's it, nothing of I love that's a great scene. It's and that yeah. scene is almost <laughs> like I don't know if he's trying to replicate the shining, like you know, Jack Nicholson going in the freezer. But when yeah. you that's another example of you open the you open the the refrigerator and there's all this incredible food and for 10 seconds I'm totally enjoying you watching you eat chicken and then he really comes in and and it and and sort of ruins it for you so that was another great great example but you were going to say something about that scene it's so mean it's unbelievably unnecessarily mean to watch someone like that eating and you know what I mean you have like grease on your fingers and you're just the shame in it and like I I uh oh actually I was just gonna say um so the whole movie like we had no time to make it like a, like any cool thing to do you just feel like you're just you, you just race through the whole thing but uh whatever the reason I'm saying that is because we didn't he didn't cut anything out of the movie like everything we did a couple takes of everything and we were gone and like the movie yeah. he just he, 
we finished it in March and we were in Venice premiering the movie in like September. He turned this thing around so quickly because he didn't have that much. It was like we made one movie and he put it together. But the one thing that was cut that I was like, you know, this was definitely like a studio note and like not everyone got it. And I understand maybe like pushing it too far into this like dream state was maybe like the wrong choice. And ultimately Pablo is an uncompromising person and he made the choice. But I literally take my wedding ring off at the end of that scene and eat it. <laughs> at, like, I just think that's the coolest, weirdest, most punk, most, uh, it's just so symbolic and cool. That was the one thing that was a little too weird <laughs> to keep in the movie. Well, maybe um, but. you have the other, uh, another thing that I, you know, what's interesting about the movie is how food becomes so important for her because she's starving. She's emotionally starving. And so when you're eating with this passion, you know, and uh, it, 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 it shows like somebody who's trying to be, get, gain some sort of love. You know, and that to me is why the food in the movie being so sumptuous, you know, becomes so uh, important. And then later on in the scene, you alluded to the eating of the wed uh, wedding ring, but you have the other scene where she's, you know, which is probably the most notable scene in the movie of, eat, you know, eating the pearls. Yeah. Which is so disturbing. Um, and so I talk a little bit about that scene and, what that was like to film. How long did that take? That was a half a day. Like we shot yeah. in the morning. Yeah, we shot something in the morning and then that was like after lunch was until we wrapped. I couldn't believe how far he pushed that. I've said that, but um, yeah. yeah uh, well, well, she said the, some- The metaphor, the metaphor is like, look what this woman literally has to swallow. Like yeah. that's what I got from the scene, you know, like, the, there's there's so many metaphors in that dining in that dinner table scene you know that I think women yeah. can do yeah like they don't look like that they don't have Christmas dinner like that it's not like it's that formal they're not in formal wear they're not all sitting there like in unison eating soup but that might be what it felt like to her in those moments just the coldness and the isolation and just like knowing that everyone knows everything and how embarrassing that is and just knowing that you're like I can't show up I am a petulant. I am so pissed. Like I, I can't be here. Like I, I, I completely, oh, I mean like, you know, whatever. I know that feeling and like, um, yeah, I think, I, I, I think to just pay credence to that type of inner life is so weird and cool. And so cool that a dude made this movie. It's just so respectful and so nice. Yeah. It just makes me very emotional. <laughs> Um, yeah, I loved making that. I, I really loved doing that scene, but it was hard. And yeah, I think I was going to say something else, but I forgot. So please ask me something else. No, I was going to say you must be quite proud then to see, because again, you have to go, you have to be able to trust your director. You know, your some of the scenes, you know, self-harm, vomiting on the toilet. I mean, you, you really have to trust that the director is going to support you that all this stuff is going to be pieced together into a seamless performance. And I think that the, that's where the director really has your back and really has you covered, you know, it, it, it it's seamless, you know, those yeah. are not easy scenes to, to do, you know, and, and to, to not only do the scene because it's not just shocking, as I said, there's a lot of metaphors that are going on, you know, how women are, everybody thinks I'm crazy, you know, and the, and, and the, the whole idea of wearing the, you know, wearing the pearls and what it means and, and having to dress up and be presentational. So I think that all of that comes through um, mm -hmm. and her, even her, the sense of control that she gets from, you know, regurgitating. And yeah, I mean, there was this one thing she said that was really like striking and, and like, it sticks with you is like, and this is like, I think this is in the crown. It's in every documentary. It's like something that she fame. She talked about it a lot too. Is like, there was this one moment where she was on in Australia with Charles and she was like, I don't know. I think she was at Ayers rock or something like that. And she was like feeling faint. She probably had, hadn't eaten in like days or had just thrown up or whatever. And just, she was like, I said, 
I said, darling, I think I'm going to disappear. And then she just like slid down his body and like fainted. Yeah. And he was so embarrassed. And he was like, get up there. Photographer's here. And like, and it was like a, but just, she was disappearing. She was trying to cease to exist. And that sort of like the throwing up thing, obviously there, she became a spokesperson and, and absolutely was very, very vocal about that particular struggle and wanted to help other people who, you know, had similar ways of coping. Mm -hmm. But it's also such a good metaphor for what she was going through that it almost feels written, even though it's true and, it, and that it happened. Do you know what I mean? It's like just yeah. the control, um, the, the shame spiral, wanting to disappear. The It's just, yeah, it's almost too so spot on. I also wanted to talk about the relationship with the head chef, where again, food becomes very important. Um, mm -hmm. Sean Harris, who's very, he plays the, the, the chef at the castle, who's very sympathetic to you and trying to make your favorite desserts, you know, so you, so you'll eat. And yeah. it's almost weirdly again, like this very, the most intimate relationship she has uh, are, are, is with the staff. Yeah. You know, the, the, and also with her, with her dresser, who's played by uh, Maggie, who's played by Sally Hawkins. And those, the two Dianas, the public Diana that's with her family and then the private Diana. But w talk a little bit about the relationship um, with, uh, with Sean Harris and what, what is that all about? Because it's fascinating. He's trying to so, save you. <laughs> yeah. So Sean Harris is a method actor. Um, like in, in an extreme sense, I, he introduced himself to me on the red carpet for our movie in London. He said, Hey, I'm Sean. I was like, wow. That is funny. Yeah. That's fascinating because he almost comes out of the blue. Like, wait a minute, who's this guy? This is this some yeah. genius movie. And then all of a sudden you get this kind of redheaded guy, <laughs> you know, yeah. very, and he's very, he's the most forward with you. Everybody else is kind of treats you as Princess Diana, but he treats you like, you know, his little sister. Yeah. So he's the only person in the movie, Darren, um, that is named and is based on a real person. Um, Darren McGrady worked for the Queen for, I think, like 12 years, like a very, very long time. And then when Diana left and started living in Kensington, he went with her and he was her chef up until she died. And so he really loves her and knows her. And uh, I got to meet him the other night, which was Aww. just incredible. Um, but uh, he was so nice. Um, but yeah, that dynamic is so telling because she would go, like there are so many stories about her going downstairs and like wanting to eat meals with them instead of being upstairs with like the more formal whatever. And it, it, some people were really thrown for a loop and didn't know how to deal with it and thought it was weird that the behavior yeah. was, you know, it was off-putting because they couldn't relax around her. And she was just really reaching. She was, in, she was just craving so deeply. She was so, I was like, the thing that you notice the most when you read all this stuff is like, who's your friend? Like, where are your best friends? Where's your sis? Where's your mom? Like what, where are the women in your life? She had to go downstairs and like kick it with those guys. And in the movie, he is somebody that is like, you know, rooting for her. Like, I don't know. He's kind of like us. Like we go, when he says, most people here just want you to be the same person that you were when you got here. And she's like, I don't even know who that is. It's yeah. so sad. Like, cause she's so, um, available and she's so herself but she doesn't even know who that is but everyone else does but she doesn't you know what I mean so it's like uh it's really sad the um and then I wanted to talk about the relationship with Maggie with her dresser um which again sometimes you don't know if it's real <laughs> you know sometimes in the movie you don't know now wait a minute is she really her dresser or is this is this fantasy because she goes away and then she comes back and you never really are absolutely sure that she's a real person. Yeah. Especially because she's having all these like Anne Boleyn visions and she's just sort of creating all these ghost like friends for herself. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, wait, is, who, is Maggie an angel? Like, um, 
And, you know, uh, Sally is that person too. I don't know if she's like a huge method actor, but maybe she yeah. is. And she just didn't tell me because from the moment I met this person, I was like, oh, like so relieved. She has this unbelievable alleviating and like really supportive presence. And she's funny as hell. We couldn't stop laughing. Like literally her and I can't, we piss our pants together. Like I can't hang out with her. I can't, I can't make movies with her unless we can laugh throughout the entire experience. And that is also what's great about their dynamic is that, you know, they shine yeah. with each other. Yeah. yeah. She offers some relief uh, yeah. to the film and, and some joy. So, that you, you know, you're not thinking, um, you know, her, her life is, you know, to a total, a total hell. Um, yeah. In the little time that I have left, I wanted to talk about the process of getting ready for the role in terms of like clothes and hair and makeup. And what Ooh. is that important to you? Um, I, for me, hair is like 90% of my acting. Hair. Yeah. Hair is like, yeah. if I don't have the hair, I, I don't have anything. And again, you're playing a real person. And in terms of the, um, the clothes uh, and the costumes by uh, Jacqueline Duran and how vital they are because they express various moods in the, in the piece. And how was it, how, what was the process like of deciding what you were going to wear for what scene? Um, so we had to do so much. So, so Jacqueline couldn't come to set. She was stuck in the UK and we shot in Germany. Um, so she designed this movie remotely wow. and, uh, like we had our first two fittings in person. And then after that, we were like cut off. And, uh, I mean, they were, look, they were really long fitting. So it, yeah. it was fine. Her clothes have more integrity and tell their own story in a way that is just, I think she's like a virtue virtuoso, uh, uh, designer. I just think that what she does alongside all of the other work, like, it, you know, as, as you, as you know, if you're not wearing the right stuff, if your pockets don't work, if you feel like you're in like a costume, you have no chance. You're, 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 you're screwed from the start and hair too. Everything, everything. There's a, there are a couple of movies that I will not mention right now because I don't want to like upset anyone, but when you can't get the hair right, it, I mean, the performance is ruined literally like the whole thing. It's like, you, you don't even, it, you're yeah. Um, yeah. for this, I wanted to cut my hair and I wanted to be able to have it for real because I wanted to be able to, you know, if I wanted to stick my head in a sink or, you know, rip some of it out or just, you know, throw my head, just do anything. I wanted to be able to feel like a real person. I wore a wig, which was like spectacularly done. And it made me feel, I was wrong. Um, once the thing went on, it felt like it was, it was like, this was her. Do you know what I mean? It, it, right. it was put on me and, and it was, it was like, because we weren't doing a, a story that was literal, mm -hmm. we were doing, it's like her hair probably didn't look like that in that year, but we chose the shape specifically to just sort of like be an iconic, like it was, I, it was iconic. It was like, let's do the thing that everyone knows. At that stage, her hair was like shorter. Do you know what I mean? It, it was, it was shorter. It was sportier, like um, creating this, image was a really big deal because the movie is not straight down the line. Um, and Pablo, Pablo is so obsessed. He's so obsessed with aesthetic and like, he needs to touch every piece of fabric before he'll put it in his movie. He goes like, Oh, this isn't the right material. Um, he took every single, he was the onset stills photographer. Essentially he took every photo that's that we've been using for promotion. It's all internal. It's all an art project. Like that never happens. Usually there's a huge, like there's a discrepancy between, there's just like a distant, there's a, you know, you promote the movie one way, you make the movie another. This was all just like totally. So basically what you're, what I'm trying to say in, in order to answer your question specifically is every single brick of this house was laid like this. Mm. And then the next one and like laid. And also, but also not precious, but like, you know what I mean? It was just, yeah. we got so lucky. Our team, I got there and I was like, I'm the last factor. This is stunning. It's perfect. My fucking stage is so set to like slaughter. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, I really hope 
that I uh, don't ruin all of your beautiful work. <laughs> the um, in the montage, there's a montage of you in various outfits where you're dancing. Um, did you use any particular type of song to dance to? So we shot that at the end of every single day of shooting and he would oh, choose a different cool. song. So um, it was like a different outfit, different yeah. location, different song. And whatever oh. we had, it was kind of like how we could process our day. It was like, if, right. if, if, if today we need to like dance around in our underwear to pop music, that's what we're going to do. If we need to like cry to like some sort of like Miles Davis ballad, yeah. that's what we'll do. Um, yeah, it was different every day. The, um, everybody talks about how you nailed the accent, but what I thought you nailed was the body language and which doesn't feel, I mean, again, as I'm watching the movie, it, it, it makes me feel uncomfortable. You know, I feel uncomfortable because you're so bent down and all of that. And, and so my two questions are, how did you find the body language? And then how did, it make you feel like every day, like, did you have like a stiff neck or, you know, <laughs> did you, you know, what does it feel like to be that? Because you're, you're like this, you know, you're, it's like a horse or something that's only looking, <laughs> yeah. you know, kicked. Um, and the, and so those are, you know, that just talk a little bit about, about that, getting that body language. Um, well, she's always communicating physically and non-verbally. And so there were so many gesture, gestural things that I noticed about yeah. her and like so many, like very, very particular idiosyncratic, like ways that she would express herself. It's like, there are times where those eyeballs are, you know, she could just be saying like, hello, heart, how are you? But her eyes are screaming, save me. Yeah. Like desperately. And, um, yeah, physically, I, uh, it was so braced, like everything was so like the tension and the undulation in contrast to how tall she is. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a little person and she is really long. Uh -huh. And, uh, I was really self-conscious about that. Like in the beginning, I was like, ah, she has a statuesque thing that is really like you know, she, she's aspirational in, a, in an aesthetic and sort of we're all conditioned to think that that's, you know, I mean, she's really, really, really statuesque and beautiful, but it's not just a, a visual thing. Like it's everything. She's so, what I'm trying to say is she's so big and she's so small. Mm -hmm. And it like, and it's and it, sometimes in the same moment. And that is weird. And it feels like she's being ripped apart. Um, yeah, there was such a, like protecting thing, but then also like she's a master manipulator. So she knows how to like reach out from behind these walls in a physical way. Um, she's such an interesting person to watch. If you really like watch all the interviews, you're like, I mean, she's kind of a genius to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. The, um, in, um, uh, along the same lines in, in terms of the using your body to convey certain emotions were there any scenes in particular where i don't know you just had to recover from that or because it it, it just it never i mean the only scene where she's just kind of having fun is with her two boys yeah you know but that constant tension of her of her body is uh very is striking you know my feet hurt so badly. I was so cold. I was constantly dressed up like a doll. I was so uncomfortable. I could never sit down. I was always waiting for like the next thing going like, oh, what are we gonna shoot next? And then Pablo would yeah. go, actually, we're gonna do this. And I, I always had to be like ready for whatever. And then be like, I was like corseted and wearing tights and then like stockings. And I don't wanna ever see a pair of stockings as long as I live. <laughs> I am not this person. Like it is so hard for me to contort my body into those positions. Like even just in terms of being looked at all the time, yeah. being watched, like you said in the beginning, you're like, yeah, it's great. Everyone's looking at you. I, I'm actually like not, it, I don't like that unless it's a very specific, like now is the time thing. Um, the, con the physical contortion, I can only imagine what actually she had to deal with. 
she worked constantly. They worked her constantly. She was always having to present. And if you don't even know who you are, like, look, I don't love doing press. I don't love going out and like taking photos, whatever, but at least I like, at least I'm allowed to be who I am. I'm allowed to have real conversations and whatever. They were like asking her to be constantly presenting, but what? Like she had such a stifled sort of, you know, form formative few years. She right. was in the years that she was supposed to be figuring out who she was. She was like, you know, having to already sort of perpetuate a lie. And so she kind of just didn't, she like ceased to exist. And you can see it. She's like, you know, screaming out to just like find a voice. Um, yeah, the, in the movie, he talks, uh, Prince Charles talks about the public persona, about being two people. And I'm wondering if that had any resonance, you know, with you being a famous actress. And of course, in this world today of social media, which has so much scrutiny, that idea of it's frustrating. Nobody wants to be two people. <laughs> like who wants to be two people? You know? It's not possible. I, it, honestly, it's I, like that, you know, we all tell ourselves stories to get through. That is a story. You can't be two people. You are only yourself. I mean, like, sure. That's just a different, I just don't believe that. I don't think it's possible. And like, I've, I've, so much advice has been given to me, like when I was younger and I had like, you know, just a harder time, like being a public person, which now I'm fine with. Um, but it was always like, that was the first bit of advice was like, you know, when you go do these interviews and you just, just go, go be someone else and protect like this version. I was like, yeah, but I really like, like what I, but then I don't get to live. Like, I want to be there. I, look, if it was so bad, I wouldn't do it. It's literally just that it's, it's worth, it's worth being there. I think this weird, ridiculous idea of, of even actors that think that they can hide behind characters. It's like, you are you. You are you all the time. There is no other you but you. I don't really know what that is. Um, well, I hate to say this, but uh, unfortunately, I have to go, Kristen. I'm so sorry. But I can't, uh, believe, that you, I can't believe that you spent this much time with me. <laughs> Seriously. You know, it's been so much fun getting to talk to you. And, uh, yeah. you know, you're an incredibly poised young woman and actress and uh i really admire that you are very i mean not only are you in charge of your films and your film roles but as i said in watching the kristen stewart film festival that i come <laughs> away <laughs> i've come away with a newfound respect for you if that's possible wow so, god so continued I, I hope we get to meet in person someday have a dance off or talk <laughs> yeah <about it. laughs> or have a big uh big or a conversation about hair yeah, it's everything and <laughs> congratulations again on your on your oscar nomination best of luck i want to thank any everyone at the uh at the sag foundation for uh for letting me uh for letting me interview Kristen. Uh, I'm trying to think on behalf of SAG AFTRA, thank you for sharing your experiences and all fellow SAG performers. Mwah. Okay, Kristen, have a great night. Good luck. You too. Thank Bye. you so much for doing this. Bye.